the lives and deaths of stars with astrophysicist Simone Skerin G. Hello and welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. This week we're going to look in on the lives and deaths of stars with Simone Skerin G, astrophysicist at Durham University. Now, when we look up at the moonless, cloudless night sky far away from city lights, we may see as many as 5,000 stars. These distant dots of light may seem eternal, but this illusion is merely an effect of our momentary fleeting lives in the cosmos. Just like humans, stars are born, live, and they die. Most stars are found within local families called galaxies. Our own Milky Way is thought to contain somewhere around 400 billion stars. That's a lot. And there may be a trillion galaxies spread throughout the cosmos. That's a heck of a lot. Now, stars form within massive clouds of gas and dust similar to the stellar nursery we call the Orion Nebula. The Mayan civilization believed this fuzzy patch of light in the sky was the embodiment of the fires of creation. And for star systems being born there, they're right on the mark. Now, as stars coalesce, increasing mass results in an enormous gravitational field, pulling the nascent star inward toward a gravitational collapse. Temperatures and pressures at the core of stars is great enough to not just shatter atoms, but to combine protons and neutrons of hydrogen, forming other isotopes of hydrogen together with helium and a lot of energy. Now this fusion pushes outward from the center of the star, and for most of the lifespan of a star, the body remains poised in a balance between this outward pressure and gravity attempting to pull the star inward. Unlike our solitary sun, most stars are formed within multiple star systems, binaries, trinaries, or moronaries. Okay, okay, I just made that last word up. In some binary systems, one star will lose material to a smaller white dwarf, the type stellar corpse, which will spiral inward, enveloping the recipient star and material from its partner. Now, if enough of this gas builds up, temperatures rise, and when the first region reaches 10 million Kelvin, it will trigger thermonuclear reactions. This in turn raises temperatures in the surrounding regions of the gaseous encasement, resulting in a chain reaction, creating a classical nova, an eruption over the surface of a, of a white dwarf. Afterward, the star is left more or less unscathed and this process can repeat. In some close binary systems, however, this eruption takes place within the bodies of the white dwarfs themselves. These outbursts result in the destruction of the smaller member, an event called a type 1a supernova. Uh, the power released by these explosions is fairly consistent, allowing astronomers to use type 1a supernovae as a standard candle with which to measure the distance to far-flung galaxies. A previously unknown type of nova, dubbed a micronova, has recently been found by a team of researchers led by Dr. Simone Scarinci of Durham University. We talked with him about this explosive new discovery. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're delighted to be joined by Simone Scaringi. He is an astrophysicist at the Center for Extragalactic Astronomy at Durham University. Recently, he's helped um, discover a previously unknown type of nova, the micronova. Welcome to the show, Simo. Hello, thank you. Thank you hey. for having me here. Oh, anytime. Um, so can you give us a brief introduction to Micronova? What are they and what makes them different from other types of novae? Yeah, sure. Um, 
So what? Uh, so Micronova, they are uh, very fast and energetic uh, flashes of light that we have observed in uh, to date three, maybe four accreting white dwarfs. Um, so the um, uh, the observation of these events is um, has come uh, with tests. This is an exoplanet finding mission and plowing through the vast uh, data sets we have, we noticed that some of these objects were having these bright flashes of light. So the, the objects were increasing in brightness by up to a factor of 30 or more. And they were doing that in about an hour. And then 10, 12 hours later, the whole event faded and it was as if nothing happened. So it, it was quite hard to begin with to try and figure out what these events actually were. Hmm. Um, and it took a while. Uh, we think what we were seeing are uh, thermonuclear explosions on the surface of accreting white dwarfs. And so that's where the, the NOVA comes, comes in. So classical NOVA have been known for uh, centuries um, and the way we interpret these events is when an, a white dwarf is accreting material from a companion star um, so these systems are usually in binaries um, and as the white dwarf accretes this material it builds um, a layer of fresh hydrogen which is just basically sucked off the companion star so what happens in classical NOVA is once this um, entire layer um, heats up enough and is dense and has high enough pressure, the whole layer will ignite and this will cause a thermonuclear explosion which will burn off the entire fresh shell of accreted hydrogen. Now NOVA events are really bright. Uh, and they last for weeks to months. Some classical nova are even observable with the naked eye. Uh, Micronova, on the other hand, are about a million times fainter than a classical nova. And that's where the name micro, the prefix micro, comes in. Um, and what we think is happening is that these white dwarfs, rather than creating material and spreading it around the entire white dwarf, uh, what's actually happening is material is being funneled and is being localized on the magnetic poles of these white dwarfs. And so this is where now uh, we need to you know, introduce the fact that some of these white dwarfs have strong enough magnetic fields that uh, accretion onto their surface doesn't necessarily happen in a spherical shell all around uh, the surface, but is rather... Uh, uh, funneled onto the magnetic poles. And the kind of closest analogy I have here is the, 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 the aurora we have on Earth mm. um, that are caused by the fact that the Earth itself has a magnetic field. Well, white dwarfs have much stronger magnetic fields and, and these are kind of the aurora equivalent, if you want. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. So fascinating. And so what would cause um, a white dwarf in, in a binary system like this to set off micronova as opposed to just going completely nova? Uh, and could it possibly fluctuate between the two? So uh, these are all very interesting and exciting questions for which I don't have a, a clear answer yet. These, these, these micronova events are really uh, new. Uh, so we can only speculate, but we do have a follow-up uh, letter uh, that, that we published where we, we, we argue that maybe what's happening is, in fact, this magnetic field of the white dwarf 
Uh, not only does it need to funnel material onto the magnetic poles, that's something that's, that several of these systems do, and we've known them for decades. So that's not the only requirement. The second requirement is that the magnetic field is strong enough that it can keep the material confined. So accreting onto the magnetic poles is not enough. The material needs to sit there, or uh, we don't know the recurrence times, but we think maybe on the order of a year. And so the material needs to stay there confined for a year or more for that material to reach these triggering conditions to ignite. Now, it's interesting because you said, can they fluctuate between micronova and nova? Well, we know, or at least we think we know of at least one object that actually does that. Wow. So there is one object that, that has shown classical nova um, and uh, occasionally, not always, but occasionally, it, it, it shows these micronova uh, bursts. Um, and how these flip between one and the other, it's really not clear at all, and, and we can only speculate at this point. It's fascinating. And so, you, as I understand it, you first came across these micronova in looking at data from tests, as you had mentioned. What, what led you to look, at, to look at that data and what were you looking for? Oh, yeah, so <clears throat> um, studying variability, so brightness variations of accreting white dwarfs is something I've been doing for several years. And with TESS, I have a program which uh, I began started in 2018 when TESS launched. Uh, so the way TESS works is you need to uh, tell the, the TESS team what targets to look at to obtain light curves mm -hmm. uh, before they're actually observed. So I prepared these kind of target lists. And to date, we have hundreds of these um, accreting white dwarfs being monitored with tests. So it's a lot of data. Um, and um, that, that's how they came to be. So when I get, when I get this, this kind of fresh data from the satellite, I look at the light curves, I run my standard analysis tools, uh, and, and try and understand the physics of accretion. So I'm actually interested in how the accretion disks work. So as material from the secondary star is sucked uh, closer and closer to the white dwarf, it will form an accretion disk, and that will slowly move material closer to the white dwarf surface. And I'm, I'm very interested in how the dynamics of these disks operate, and I find accreting white dwarfs fascinating for this kind of area of research. Um, Nonetheless, there were three objects we had in the data set which showed these bursts, um, and they, uh, that, that, that's how we got to find them, essentially. Hmm. And so how common, how common could these micronova events be throughout the Milky Way? How close could the nearest one be happening? Oh, uh, well, the closest one we have, again, the sample is very small, but it's at 500 parsecs, more or less, uh, which is relatively local in, the, in our galaxy. Um, how common could they be? Well, let, I'm not sure again, but uh, if we take the analogy to classical nova, then generally speaking, classical nova happen on the most massive white dwarfs. Mm -hmm. So building a layer around the white dwarf is not necessarily enough to then ignite this layer. What you need is very, very high pressures and the highest pressures are achieved on the heaviest objects, the heaviest white dwarfs. Uh, so how, you know, how common are the heaviest white dwarfs are there? I'm not sure, but the ones we've observed, the three objects we've observed, we know they're recurrent. So we haven't only observed one micronova event, we've observed several micronova events in the same objects. So this is a recurrent phenomena so they could be uh, quite uh, numerous, these events in the galaxy, but they're really hard to find, right? They only last for half a day, maybe a day. And so if you're not looking at the right time and at the right place, you'll just miss them. And then you'll have to wait maybe another year or two until the next one. Hmm. And speaking of learning about the next one, what is the next step in learning about micronova? Um, well, okay, there, there's two ways I'm seeing this going forward. First of all, we need to uh, 
have a larger sample of these events, um, right? When we discover something new, looking at just the, the two or three we know about now won't give us the bigger picture as to how these phenomena start, how they, how they, how they are triggered, uh, in what types of white dwarfs do they occur. For example, I keep referring to the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. That is something we think is happening because uh, the objects we've observed them uh, are magnetic, but it's not, it's, not a, um, um, it's not proven that that's the case. So on the other side, what we need to start doing is start modeling these accretion flows onto the surfaces of white dwarfs. So the question would be, can we keep material confined into a very small region and keep it there for long enough until we can ignite the whole slab of hydrogen thermonuclearly. That, that's also not uh, an easy question to answer. But those are the two things, I think. Finding more and trying to model the event. Right. So what instruments might be coming up in the future? Are you looking forward to hoping to find more of these? Uh, okay, so yeah, yeah, well, TESS, as long as TESS goes, we'll find more. TESS observes a very large chunk of the sky, and it does it for a long time. So that's kind of what you need here. You need to observe many of these objects uh, for a long time so that eventually you can pick the one or two that show these micronome events, which is basically the strategy that, that we've done. We, we weren't looking for them, but that's how we found them. So in, in that sense... There are uh, several ground-based uh, survey telescopes that might find them. Um, one of them is LSST. There's another one uh, which is called Black Gem uh, in Chile. Um, and several other ground-based synoptic sky surveys. Now, the, the, the best thing that, that we could dream of is trying to figure out a way to coordinate the observations. So but I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon, but... As soon as one of these goes off, what we'd like to do is point X-ray telescopes at these events. Because at the you know, X-ray wavelengths, we get a lot of information that, that we're not getting in the optical wave band that we are currently uh, using. Hmm. And finally, what's, what's next for you? Are you going to keep studying these micronovae? Or are you going to... Yeah, hopefully. Something else. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, whatever is uh, new and shiny, I look at it. Uh, I get interested in, 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 in things very easily. Um, but yes, we will keep looking for, for these events with these fast bursts and, and start, you know, building a list of objects that have them and, 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 and really trying to understand if uh, and how these, these thermonuclear explosions happen uh, on, on white dwarf surfaces. Fabulous. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Simo. It was great talking with you. Thank you very much. And that was Simone Scaringi, assistant professor at the Center for Extragalactic Astronomy at Durham University. Now, our sun fuses around 620 million metric tons of hydrogen every second, turning around four and a quarter million metric tons of matter into electromagnetic radiation. E equals MC squared. In the four and a half billion years the sun has lit up the sky, our parent star has converted roughly one Saturn worth of hydrogen gas into energy. Pretty cool, huh? Naturally, this can only continue for as long as stars retain enough fuel. When that fuel runs out, gravity begins to draw the body inward once more, pretending it's death. How this process unfolds depends entirely on the mass of the star. Our own sun, a relatively small star, has been shining for around four and a half billion years. As time goes on, the surface of our maturing star is heating up. Within a billion years or so, temperatures on Earth will have grown so hot that all the oceans will boil away, followed by a period where the surface of our planet will be a parched, scorched landscape, 
even hotter than Arizona in late June. <laughs> <laughs> Roughly four and a half billion years from now, the sun's going to run out of hydrogen, available hydrogen, and gravity will pull our venerable star inward, igniting helium fusion at its core. This ignition will force the sun to increase in size once more, forming a red giant, swallowing the planets Mercury and Venus, and most likely the lifeless remains of Earth. Over time, this helium fuel will run out and the sun will shrink once again into a white dwarf. White dwarfs are the size of Earth. Shocking. Stars more than eight times as massive as our sun, however, are able to fuse helium into carbon. These stars, too, need a final collapse and can erupt in a Type II supernova, the titanic explosion of a massive star. These eruptions can leave behind a neutron star, which is typically the size of a city. Just, and just one teaspoon of this ultra-dense material would weigh more than Mount Everest. The ultimate fate can await stars that begin with 30 times as much mass as the sun. The most massive stars in the cosmos can sometimes end their lives as black holes, the most mysterious objects in the cosmos. Visit us next week on The Cosmic Companion as we look at how science fiction inspires science fact. We're going to talk with Jenny Curtis and Chris Porter from Solar, the new hit science fiction podcast starring Ellen Hunt. Make sure to join us starting on Tuesday, 31st of May. Please subscribe, follow, and share The Cosmic Companion anywhere and everywhere. Clear skies.